Welcome everybody. We are doing the CIC study course series four certified infection control study guide and this time we're talking about epidemiology. As a reminder this video series is designed to help you pass the CIC exam. Not necessarily everything you need in infection prevention but it is focused on exam materials as presented in the APIC Study Guide 6th edition. We will begin by talking about some basics in epidemiology. First, virulence, which has two elements. The first is the ability of an organism to survive in the external environment during the transit between the host. The second element is, is a mechanism for transmission to a new host. Targeted surveillance, tracking high risk, high volume populations like we definitely do in acute care settings. And then when we talk about biohazard and waste, we have to remember there are five factors that must be present for waste to cause infection, dose to host susceptibility, presence of a pathogen, virulence of a pathogen, and a portal of entry, way to access the body. More basics in epidemiology, the concepts of endemic, epidemic, and pandemic. So endemic and endemic disease, always present in the population. Like the flu, we're always gonna have flu. However, some years we have an epidemic of flu, an increase in the disease incidence. And what we don't want at all is a pandemic, which is an epidemic that has spread over a wide geographic area. So endemic, epidemic, pandemic. Now we'll go ahead and talk about the concepts, concepts of sensitivity and specificity. So sensitivity is the true positive rate. So it measures the proportion of positives that are currently identified as such. So another way we can think about it as a percentage of sick people who are correctly identified as having the condition. Conversely, we have specificity, which is the true negative rate. And it measures the proportion of negatives that are correctly identified as such. So the percentage of healthy people who are correctly identified as not having the condition. So to remember these, we can remember that in sensitivity, sensitivity has an N. So the N in sensitivity measures the opposite, which is the positives. And conversely, the P in specificity, so it measures the opposite, which is negative. So if that is helpful to you. So if you find yourself struggling with these concepts when you go to answer the questions in the APIC 6th edition, uh, study guide, you can refer to this link here. And I find this link, it's a YouTube link, to be particularly useful. It talks about uh, car alarms and setting car alarms and which way is, is best to do that. And it relates it back to the concepts of sensitivity and specificity. Moving on to some more basics of epidemiology. Now we'll talk about the positive predictive value, which is the probability of having the disease given a positive screening test that uh, in the screen population. It's the proportion of people with a positive test results who actually have the disease. So this is what we call a two by two table and we'll see these uh, a few times here in this presentation. So at the top, we have truth, <laughs> those that have the disease and those that do not have the disease. And then there on the left side, we have the test result, positive and negative. And so in the A box, we have true positives. The patient has the disease and the test result picked it up as positive. Then we have people that do not have the disease and, but the test results said they did. So those are B, the false positives. Then in C, we have people 
that have the disease, but the test result was negative. So these are false negatives in box C. And then in box D, we have um, the true negatives, which they do not have the disease and the test result got it right and resulted in negative. And then we have um, column totals at the bottom and row totals going across. So positive predictive value, it's a necessary part of our job to realize that the tests that we look at are not 100% uh, accurate. So positive predictive value, probability of having the disease given a positive screening test, um, proportion of people with a positive result who have a, have a disease. Let's look at an example here. So positive predictive value can be a tri tricky topic. So you will have to make a judgment based on your experience and time to prepare for the CIC, uh, how much you, you spend on this. Uh, but it is my job here to present all of the information to you and then you can um, decide how much time to spend on the various topics. So in our example here, though, we have 200 patients which are enrolled in a study to evaluate the accuracy of a new ELISA-based test, the diagnosis of influenza. I remember an ELISA-based test we talked about before, the enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay. Um, 100 patients were diagnosed with influenza by the reference standard and 80 of the patients with influenza had a positive ELISA-based test, as did five patients without influenza. So our question is, what is the probability of influenza in a patient who tests positive on the ELISA-based test? So we're starting our two by two, we have positive and negative. Um, we remember our formula here is true positives divided by true positives plus false positives. So we have influenza yes, influenza no in our example, and we're testing the ELISA. So in our problem, we're told that 100 patients were diagnosed with influenza. So we say, okay, 100 down here at the bottom, and it's a total of 200 patients, so we have to have, if 100 patients had it, then 100 patients didn't. And we'll start filling in our box. We put the 80 in what would be box A, because we are told 80 of the patients with influenza had a positive ELISA, so that goes in that box. And then we're also told that five of the patients um, without influenza tested positive. So that goes here in box B, no influenza, but the ELISA said there was. So now we're going to kind of make the columns add up for the uh, remaining boxes that are empty. So if we subtract um, 80 from 100, we get 20. And uh, 5 from 100, we get 95. So in predictive value t uh, calculations, we add up horizontally. If we were going to do calculations on sensitivity and specificity, we would add vertically the columns, but uh, the CIC study guide doesn't suggest that you need to know how to do that, so I didn't cover it. So we're going to go ahead and add horizontally for this. So if we add 80 plus 5, we get 85. 20 plus 95, we get 115. So we have our totals as well. So now we can go ahead and look at our calculation. True positive, so we have 82 positives divided by the total positives and or the true positives and the false positives. So that's the 85 there. And if we multiply by 100 to get the percentage, we get 94%. So 94% of our patients um, actually had the disease and have a positive test. So that is a example of how to do positive predictive value. And here is the reference I used uh, for this example, the link and then the uh, original author. 
let's look at an example here. So positive predictive value can be a tri tricky topic. So you will have to make a judgment based on your experience and time to prepare for the CIC, uh, how much you, you spend on this. Uh, but it is my job here to present all of the information to you and then you can um, decide how much time to spend on the various topics. So in our example here though, we have 200 patients which are enrolled in a study to evaluate the accuracy of a new ELISA-based test, the diagnosis of influenza. I remember an ELISA-based test we talked about before, the enzyme-linked immune absorbent assay. Um, 100 patients were diagnosed with influenza by the reference standard and 80 of the patients with influenza had a positive ELISA-based test, as did five patients without influenza. So our question is, what is the probability of influenza in a patient who tests positive on the ELISA-based test? So we're starting our two by two, we have positive and negative. Um, we remember our formula here is true positives divided by true positives plus false positives. So we have influenza yes, influenza no in our example, and we're testing the ELISA. So in our problem, we're told that 100 patients were diagnosed with influenza. So we say, okay, 100 down here at the bottom, and it's a total of 200 patients, so we have to have, if 100 patients had it, then 100 patients didn't. And we'll start filling in our box. We put the 80 in what would be box A, because we are told 80 of the patients with influenza had a positive ELISA, so that goes in that box. And then we're also told that five of the patients um, without influenza tested positive. So that goes here in box B, no influenza, but the ELISA said there was. So now we're going to kind of make the columns add up for the uh, remaining boxes that are empty. So if we subtract um, 80 from 100, we get 20. And uh, 5 from 100, we get 95. So in predictive value t uh, calculations, we add up horizontally. If we were going to do calculations on sensitivity and specificity, we would add vertically the columns, but uh, the CIC study guide doesn't suggest that you need to know how to do that, so I didn't cover it. So we're going to go ahead and add horizontally for this. So if we add 80 plus 5, we get 85. 20 plus 95, we get 115. So we have our totals as well. So now we can go ahead and look at our calculation. True positive, so we have 82 positives divided by the total positives and or the true positives and the false positives. So that's the 85 there. And if we multiply by 100 to get the percentage, we get 94%. So 94% of our patients um, actually had the disease and have a positive test. So that is a example of how to do positive predictive value. And here is the reference I used uh, for this example, the link, and then the uh, original author. So non-calculation based is what's called the chain of infection. So I always tell people I have an easy job. I just have to break one of the links in the chain of infection. So the chain of infection begins with the infectious agent, the reservoir, the portal of exit, the mode of transmission, the portal of entry, and the susceptible host. So if we stick with that influenza example, the agent, influenza, the virus, the reservoir would be um, the patient that has uh, active influenza disease, portal of exit, let's just say they sneeze, so it's the nose, 
the mode of transmission. Um, we know that influenza is carried by droplets, uh, so it's the droplet portal of entry. So a lot of times that is the um, nose, mouth, eyes of the face. So one of those and then the susceptible host. So to break one link in this chain, we can use Tamiflu to stop the infectious agent from being there. The reservoir, um, we can ask, we can isolate, and we can remind sick healthcare workers not to come to work, and we can ask visitors that are sick to not come to the hospital. We can break the link of the one of the links in the chain of infection by the portal of exit, asking people to sneeze into the crook of their arm or into a tissue and then throw it away and do hand hygiene. Uh, the mode of transmission, we can um, ask a patient to wear a mask and then that also works for healthcare workers, the portal of entry. If somebody does, patient does sneeze and you have a mask on and you're following proper isolation precautions and you won't get sick because you've broken that chain you have with a mask for the healthcare provider. And then susceptible hosts, we can break that link because hopefully we're gonna get immunized for influenza. So that is how we break one of the links in the chain of infection uh, to stop disease from occurring. Different types of immunity that we need to know about, passive, active, and herd immunity. So in passive immunity, the short-term immunity that results from the introduction of antibodies from another person or animal, this can either be natural or artificial. If it's passive natural immunity, it's mother to a child, either during childbirth or during breastfeeding with the antibodies in the breast milk. Passive artificial immunity, uh, antibodies are given. We talked about this in lab topics in that video. And we said that um, human immunoglobulins are available for hepatitis A and B, measles, polio, rubella, rabies, and varicella zoster. So should somebody be exposed, we can give them passive artificial immunity by giving them antibodies. Then we have active immunity, immunity that results from the production of antibodies by the immune system in the response to the presence of an antigen. So again, we have natural and passive. So active natural immunity is where you get the disease, you make the antibodies, you get better. And then in active passive immunity is where you get a vaccine. And then herd immunity, I can't emphasize how important herd immunity is, as we have people that are um, not capable of eliciting a immune response, the non-responders, to a vaccine, or um, people that aren't able to take vaccines because of immune status, they rely on herd immunity, which is when a large enough proportion of the population is immune to an infectious disease, that immunity is offered to the non-immune. So they are susceptible to the disease, but they don't get the disease because such a large amount of people are immune to it that the disease isn't going to be able to be present in the population. Very important concept, especially when we talk about vaccines. So now we'll talk about causation and this is really what we want to find. We want to find a relationship between cause and effect when we're doing research. So yes, we want to say smoking causes lung cancer, among other health problems, so don't smoke. So we want to do this in public health so we can drive um, healthy behaviors. So to do this, a lot of times we use Hill's criteria of causality. So there's actually nine different elements. I'm not going to go through all of them. I'm going to go through the ones that are mentioned in the Apification Guide. Beginning with strength of association. And so this says that the incidence of disease should be higher in those who are exposed. Of course, that makes sense. 
um, specificity, the evidence that the independent and dependent, dependent variables relate, and then consistency, which is really important and that we see the association in, in more than one study. So, you know, you see something and you think it's worthy of uh, attention and so you publish it and so can other people uh, find that same association. So consistency, another one of Hill's criteria. Then there's what's known as the web of causation, which is the interrelationship of multiple factors that contribute to the occurrence of a disease. The web of causation showing the interrelationship of diff different factors, and these different factors will cause um, different diseases. So we also have the epidemiological triangle model of disease causation. And this model associates the agent, the host, and the environment with uh, the cause of disease. So this works really well if we think about C. Diff difficile infections. So um, in a non-disease state, the host, the human host, is um, in balance with the C. diff uh, because the environment, the intestinal stomach flora, is well populated. So when the environment becomes not so well populated, like when we take antibiotics, then the host changes, the environment changes, and the agent, the C. difficile, is therefore able to proliferate in the new environment, not in balance, and cause disease. So the epidemiological triangle of disease causation. outbreaks. So it's defined as an incidence rate that is more than two standard deviations, higher than the previous year time period. There are different types of surveillance that are used for outbreaks, syndromic surveillance and sentinel surveillance primarily. Uh, syndromic surveillance used to detect outbreaks uses real-time data for early response. And then sentinel uh, surveillance collects data from sample reporting sites. And then sometimes we have a pseudo outbreak, which is an apparent increase in disease incidence due to unrelated circumstances. So just remember that not every time somebody comes to you and says, we have an outbreak, it doesn't mean we do. Sometimes it's a pseudo outbreak. There are different steps in identifying or, uh, an outbreak and conducting an outbreak investigation. And I don't necessarily want you to memorize these, but I want you to think about them and the order in which they go because it, it's very logical and intuitive. So first we have to confirm the presence of an outbreak. Like I said before, just because someone says, oh, we've got you know this going on, doesn't actually mean we do. Maybe they're new to the community and they've never seen a a disease, but it's actually a disease that's endemic in your area. So you have to always confirm the presence of the outbreak. Sometimes you're doing this uh, by looking at lab results or uh, discharge coding or something of that nature. Once you confirm the presence of an outbreak, then you're going to alert key partners about the investigation. In other words, you're not going to go to your CEO and say, we have an outbreak until you have confirmed that that outbreak exists. Then after you've alerted the key administration and key partners, you're going to perform a literature review to learn more about uh, the disease or the pathogen involved. Then you're going to establish a preliminary case definition. So a case definition, this is identifying basically who this disease is affecting. So is it affecting males or females? Is it affecting the elderly or the young? Or is there no uh, involvement of age whatsoever? Is it affecting patients of all ages? Is it affecting uh, uh, females? And then if so, is pregnancy? Is it only affecting pregnant females? So you start developing this case definition. Who is involved 
you know, what does the patient population, you know, quote unquote, look like? Then you're developing a methodology for case finding. So you say, okay, this is what my cases, you know, quote unquote, look like. Uh, how am I going to find cases? Then you're going to develop a line list and an epi curve, and we'll talk more about an epi curve in a minute. And a line list is just basically listing out everybody who you've identified and the important characteristics, demographic as well as uh, medical indicators. And you're going to observe and review potentially implicated patient care activities. So this is where you're start starting to look into. Is it because people aren't washing their hands? Is it because the scope wasn't cleaned? That sort of thing. You're going to consider whether environmental sampling should be performed. So this would be the only time we'd really be looking at doing environmental sampling is during an outbreak investigation. Then we're going to start implementing control measures. So when I, I said initially, I don't want you to necessarily memorize these in order because I think it's so logical and intuitive. You're not going to do the last step of implementing initial control measures before you even confirm the presence of the outbreak. You're not going to uh, consider environmental sampling um, as the second step before you alert everybody what's going on. You're going to do that near the end. So I think that these are very logical steps and the steps that you need to know in case you ever have to investigate an outbreak in your facility. So moving on to types of data. We have discrete data which is uh, information that can be categorized into classification integers, for example, number of patients on isolation. It's discrete data. Then you have continuous data, data that can be plotted on a number line. You have categorical data, which are, counts both events and non-events, like uh, in SSIs. Non-categorical data counts all the events, like the uh, happy per patient days. Quantitative data, numerical data, rates, proportions, fractions, what we're used to kind of using when we prepare our reports. And then there is qualitative data, which is really a fascinating use of data um, because it is visual data, recorded data, focus studies, studies of behavior. Qualitative data can be very powerful uh, when presenting to our staff. Graphs are methods of showing quantitative data. The x-axis is usually a time variable known as the independent variable. The y-axis is usually the frequency of occurrence. Um, usually the independent variable, the dependent variable. Histograms are graphical displays of data using bars with different heights, similar to a bar chart with no space between bars. Uh, but a histogram groups numbers into ranges. So if we look here, this is the height of a black cherry tree. And then here on the x-axis, the bottom, we have height. And then on the y-axis, we have frequency. So we read this by we say, well, there are two trees that have a height of uh, 60 feet, and then another two that have a height of uh, 65 and to 70, and then there are eight with a height of 70 to 75, and so on. Then we have our fishbone diagram. A fishbone diagram is a type of graph that may be used during an RCA root cause analysis to identify and display the elements involved. So the fishbone diagram is um, used often in performance improvement. And here is a picture of it where you have the effect and then you have the causes uh, leading to that effect. So say, you're looking into a cotty. So 
Is the cadi caused by a machine? Is it caused by a method? Maybe we've got new people inserting our Foley's and uh, they're not using sterile technique. Is our potty increase due to measure? Maybe the NHS in definitions have changed. Is it due to materials? Do we have contaminated materials? Have we changed our packaging so people aren't using the materials correctly? Is it just a people issue where we've got a lot of um, overworked people? Is it always occurring on night shift or something like that? Is it an environmental issue? Is there something going on in the patient care environment which is contributing to that effect, in our case, in the number of cotties? Fishbone diagram, powerful tool during RCA and performance improvement in general. We have pie charts, which are circular charts divided into sectors illustrating parts of the whole. So this is when you want to demonstrate a part of a whole, you use a pie chart. Frequency polygram is a line graph used to show two sets of data on a single graph. The run chart used to identify trends over time. It's basically a line graph, but you're looking for trends over time. And then the Pareto. The Pareto is a decision-making tool used for the selection of a limited number of tasks that produce an effect. It employs what's known as the 80-20 rule, which means if you solve 80% of the problem, you're doing pretty good. So this can be used in just a variety, again, of uh, performance improvement activities. A lot of times you have to say, okay, you know, we're trying to improve hand hygiene. So I'm going to look at my compliance rates across all disciplines. And lo and behold, I notice that physicians have um, the highest rate of noncompliance, followed by our environmental services staff. And together, those two groups make up 80% of my noncompliance. So I'm not going to worry about the 20% of nurses and rad techs and pharmacy techs that aren't doing hand hygiene. I'm going to focus on my 80%, my physicians and my EBS staff that um, aren't doing hand hygiene correctly, and I'm going to target that group. And so when you do that, it's nice to have a Pareto chart to um, justify why you've made certain decisions for performance improvement. We're now going to move into talking about calculations associated with epidemiology. Now these calculations are basic um, in terms of the actual math involved. In the CIC exam you'll be given a calculator and then either a piece of paper and a pen or I was given a whiteboard with a dry erase marker. So you are going to be able to do these calculations in epidemiology in general the calculation part, the math part isn't difficult, but it's knowing what to put in the calculator. <clears throat> so first of all, the crude mortality rate is just like it suggests. It's the total number of deaths from all causes divided by the population, then multiplied by some multiplier, which is either 1,000 or 100,000. So here the numerator, so the number on top, is the number of deaths. And usually that's what the numerator is. It's the number of, you know, what you're, what you're counting. So in this case, it's the number of deaths. If you're looking at cotties, it's the number of infections you have over the Foley days. If you're looking at uh, compliance for hand hygiene, the numerator would be how many times they did hand hygiene. And then the denominator in this case is the size of the population. Um, and that's also very common. So the denominator is over the total. So you're going to put the numerator over the denominator, which is kind of the whole total that you have. And then here it's a, expressed as per 100,000 population, which is also pretty normal when you're dealing with large numbers like this. So your example for crude mortality rate, the United States in 2003, a total of 2,419,921 deaths occurred. 
the estimated population was 290,809,777. The crude mortality rate in 2003 was therefore, and then you do the division of the numerator or denominator multiplied by 100,000, which equals 832.1 deaths per 100,000 population. Cause specific mortality rate, the number of deaths from a specific cause divided by the total population and then multiplied by a multiplier. So our example here is in the United States in 2003, a total of 108,256 deaths were attributed to accidents, yielding a cost specific mortality rate of 37.2 per 100,000 population. Crude mortality rate, cause specific mortality rate. Continuing with calculations, the case fatality rate, the number of deaths from a specific disease out of the total number with the disease. And here our example is say we have a community of 300,000 residents, 5,000 have AIDS, and 200 have died of AIDS in the last year. What is the case fatality rate? Well, we give you more information than you need because it doesn't matter that there's 300,000 residents. What you're doing in the case fatality rate is you're taking the number that have died over uh, the number that have the disease and then you multiply it by a multiplier. In this case, it was just by 100 to get a percent. The attack rate, the number of cases affected with a condition divided by those in the population. So let's say we have 20 burn unit beds, five uh, patients in those beds have acinetobacter. What is the attack rate for acinetobacter among the burn unit patients? So here, we are going to divide 5 by 20 and again multiply by 100 for the percent. So we have 25% the attack rate. The surgical risk index is a score used to predict infections. So you would get like one point for ASA of uh, 3, 4, 5. You would get uh, more points for the operation was contaminated or dirty or longer than expected. This is a relatively old way now of calculating surgical risk. So now we use the SIR. This is talked about in the certification study guide, so I mention it here, but um, it, it's now been really replaced with the SIR. I wanted to go over percent of calculations because those are always um, those are always useful. So you want to know what's the percent of something. So let's say you have 15% of 240 is what? So you turn that 15% into a decimal. So you have 0.15 and you multiply it by 240. You mo know to multiply it because of the word of. So of and an equation like this means multiply and then is means equals and then if you do that math on your simple calculator it's a 36 and then percent compliant uh, again we do these a lot especially like in a hand hygiene or something or vascular access device audit um, whatever we're looking at in this example we're saying that we have 10 hand, hand hygiene opportunities and eight hand, hand hygiene was appropriate, was conducted as appropriate. So eight divided by 10 multiplied by 100 is 80%. So that's percent compliant. Incidents, we've already mentioned this word in this presentation, so we'll define it here. The incidence is the number of new cases. That, so the number of new cases in the population, it's um, something that we maybe haven't seen before, now we're starting to see, it's the new cases. The incidence density rate is the number of new cases per population at risk in a given time period. So you just kind of carry that 
one step further. Incidence is always the number of new cases. Prevalence is always the number of existing cases, those that um, are always there in the population. Attributable risk. The cases attributable and avoidable to the exposure in relation to all causes. And we have a formula here where IE is the incidence in the exposed and the IU is incidence in the unexposed. Un yeah, unexposed. And AR is attributable risk. So IE minus IU equals AR. The epi curve. So we have two different examples here. The epi, the epi curve is the epidemic curve. It provides a graphical display of the numbers of incident cases in an outbreak plotted over time. So we have an example here of the common point source epidemic, and we have uh, the propagated source epidemic. So common point source, all cases occur within one incubation period of the exposure. Propagated infections are transmitted from person to person, which is why you don't see everything happening in one given time. So. Here are the example of our common point source epidemic is the example of the Broad Street Pump, which of course is the father of epidemiology. John Snow in London realized that um, the cholera cases were linked to the Broad Street Pump being contaminated, so he simply removed the handle and once he removed the handle on that pump, uh, the number of cases dropped dramatically. Common point source epidemic. Measures of central tendency. The mean, mode, and median. With the mean, it's the traditional average most affected by outliers. So you add up all the numbers and you divide by the numbers you have. The mode is the number that appears most often. So in the first example of the mean, our average was 5.7. The mode, however, is 4. And then the median, the number in the middle of the data set, so you line up the numbers in numerical order and find the one in the middle. Um, the median here is 5. So the 4 and the 6 are in the middle, so you find the traditional average of those. And then that's your median. In this example, it is number 5. Scales of measurement, which are ways in which variables, numbers are identified and categorized. So you have nominal, categorical data and numbers that are simply used as identifiers or names like numbers on the back of a baseball jersey or your social security number. Ordinal, an ordinal scale of measurement, represents an ordered series of relationships or rank like the ranking of competition, first, second, third, etc. Interval data, a scale that represents quantity and has equal units, but for which zero represents simply an additional point of measurement. Ratio, the ratio scale of measurement is similar to the interval scale, and it also represents a quantity and has equality of units. So different scales of measurement. A key part in statistics is what is known as the normal distribution. Normal distribution represents a perfect bell-shaped curve where the mean, mode, and medium are equal. It is used in parametric statistics. Parametric statistics assumes a normal distribution. 
And in our graph here, we see a perfectly normal distribution where the average is the zero. And then between the negative one and the one is 68% of the data. So that's a standard deviation, really. The first standard deviation contains 68% of the data. The second contains 95% of the data. And the third is 99.7% of the data. Anything beyond the third standard deviation is a complete outlier. So here we see a statistical process control graph. So this is where it gets interesting. So we use statistical process control, and if we can imagine that graph just being turned 90 degrees, so we have the average there, and then we have the one sigma, where uh, sigma is the standard deviation. And then we have the two, then the three. So really, when we use statistical process control, we are using this concept of how far out or how distributed the data is. And so we can see that when we have a um, outlier, something that's above that three sigma line, it is a special cause variation because it's in the uh, complete outlier range. Um, it's excluded from 99.7% of the data set. So statistical process control, upper control limits, lower control limits, and then the amount of data that we have within the different standard deviations. Key concepts in statistics. Standard deviation we did just talk about. So standard deviation is the measure of dispersion, like we saw, of the raw score that reflects a variability in the values around the mean. Then we talk about hypothesis testing. Hypothesis testing is used to determine if a study is statistically significant. So we always have what's known as the H0 or the null hypothesis and then the alternative hypothesis with the HA. Um, and we're using these to see if there's a change in the data set. So we have two types of errors surrounding hypothesis testing. Uh, type 1 error is concluding there is a change in the data when there's not. And then a type 2 error is concluding that there's not a change in the data when there actually is. So a type 1 error, and this is just a silly thing that I was taught, and it helps me to remember the difference between these. So hopefully it'll help you. A type 1 error, concluding that there is a change in the data when there's not, is because you think you're number one. So as a researcher, a researcher always wants to show that there is a change, right? That their study is statistically significantly different, that uh, what they've done has worked and shown a change. So a type 1 error is when you think you're number one, that your data is so great and your study was so great that you're saying, oh no, I found a, a difference, uh, but there really wasn't one <laughs> because you're thinking you're number one and you're so arrogant. And then the type two, of course, just, just is the um, opposite of that. So hopefully that little trick helps you. It's kind of always helped me. So now we'll talk about the p-value. So the p-value is how likely it is that the true value is represented. So it's the probability of rejecting the null hypothesis when it is true. So how likely is the result of chance? And we usually set our p-value at 0.05 or 0.01. So if we have a p-value of less than 0.05, it's generally considered statistically significant. It is related to what's known as the power of the test that you're using. And we always have to remember that the greater the sample size, the greater the statistical power. Then we also see confidence intervals. So a confidence interval describes the amount of uncertainty associated with a sample estimate of a population parameter. As a sample size increases, again, the confidence interval becomes more precise. Correlations. So correlations are 
really interesting in statistics. It shows the strength of the relationship. So a perfect relationship, R, has a plus or minus 1. Um, if the variable increases and causes the other to increase, or if the variable decreases and causes the other to decrease. Um, so if we have a correlation of r equals zero, that means no relationship. And if we have a correlation of uh, one, it means a perfect linear relationship. And so the range is negative one to one. A uh, negative one would be a negative correlation, positive one would be positive correlation. So here on the right, the positive correlation, you see that as one thing increases, so does the other. So back in 2014, I did an APIC poster on this using um, C diff. So it just occurred to me as I was looking at our data that during this one time period, uh, just as the number of cases of community onset C. diff, we saw there was just really a direct correlation with how many hospital onset C. diff we saw. And this is actually to be expected. It's why you put uh, the community onset C. diff into NHSN, you know, and you, you enter all of that C. diff data, whether or not it's hospital onset, they actually use this in the calculation for your SIR. And I was certainly seeing that in our hospital, that the more community onset we had, the more hospital onset we had. So then we really worked on C. diff for a year, did a variety of performance improvement projects and implemented a whole lot of changes. And then the next year, I didn't see that. I didn't see that our hospital associated C. diff went up with our community associated C. diff. And, you know, that was really exciting because it showed that we're not passing it on at the same rate. So that was what the poster was about. It was about not having this correlation, which usually in research you want to have the correlation. But in this example, it was exciting to not see that, to see that we were actually um, not having the same amount of hospital C. diff, hospital onset C. diff, um, when we continue to have the same amount of community associated. So this is really how these data, these uh, different types of statistics and all can be very useful in our, in our areas. A perfect negative correlation, maybe you have a study where you're looking at hand hygiene and HAIs. So you would want a negative correlation here. Um, of course, you're never gonna get perfect when a you're dealing with world life, real life situations. But something that would uh, certainly be interesting to look at is, you know, if your hand hygiene compliance goes up, does your HAIs go down? So it would be interesting to, you know, do a project and be measuring hand hygiene compliance and then hopefully watch that as that goes up, then HAIs goes down. So that would be an example of a negative correlation. The caveat here is correlation does not mean causation. So just because two things are correlated doesn't mean one causes the other. So for an example, let's just say that in the 1970s, a study was done that showed a near perfect linear correlation between pant size pocket, so the pocket of the, the pants, and the mortality rate. So does pant size pocket um, really mean death? Well, actually what it meant was that uh, men who were smoking would buy pants that had larger pockets so that they could carry their cigarettes. So this was back in the 70s when a lot of men smoked. So they wanted to buy those pockets that were large enough to accommodate the pack of cigarettes. So the pant pocket size did not determine death. It was a, a factor uh, that was used to say, look, cigarettes are bad for you. And if you carry cigarettes, you're likely to smoke and the smoking is what causes the death. 
So correlation does not mean causation. That's your caveat there. Kurtosis measures how flat or peaked a curve is. It's a value of zero as a normal distribution. If you are plus on the kurtosis scale, it's called leptokurtic, and it indicates a larger peak where a negative on the kurtosis scale indicates a flatter curve as you're seeing here. So kurtosis. The chi-squared test, it's used on discrete data, remembering that that's counts or frequencies. Then making a two by two table, we gave you an example of that before when we talked about positive predictive value. And we use it when the sample site contains at least five in each of the cells of the table. It may be used to calculate an odds ratio or relative risk. Then the Fisher's exact test is used when the sample size is small non-parametric statistics. A lot of times you can't get that normal distribution with a small sample size. So no, no assumptions are made about distribution. Tables arrange data in rows and columns. There is what's known as the Delphi technique, which is a method of group decision making and forecasting that involves successfully collating the judgment of the experts in order to make the decisions. Research. So we often read our research journals, or at least we should. So a lot of times the first thing we have is the abstract. And we read the abstract to see if the whole journal is interesting or not, basically. It includes the intent of the objective of the study. Then comes the introduction, states the reason for the research, identifies and discusses the findings of others, includes a review of the literature. Methods, describe the research population and method used to collect and analyze the data. A lot of times this is very easy to write if you're writing a research paper, because it's just what you did. Then the results summarizes the results and presents the findings using text, charts, graphs, and tables. So this is, a, again, pretty easy section to write because you're summarizing everything. Then you do a discussion, which you're analyzing the findings, explaining the significance, the limitations, biases, internal validity, and you're perhaps adjusting future projects based on what you did. Elements of a journal article. We have different studies in, in uh, epidemiology, beginning with the observational study, which uses the two by two table. Um, these are descriptive studies, describe those affected in terms of time and place. There's two types of um, observational studies, case controls and cohorts. So a little bit more on the two by two table. So let's say in our example, we have a thousand people, 600 are smokers with cancer, 100 are non-smokers, don't have cancer, 200 have smokers, no cancer, 100 non-smokers and do not have cancer. So we'd fill out our disease, our um, two by two table like this. We'd say disease status here at top, exposure status on the side. Yes, no, yes, no. So our 600, Smokers have cancer. It would come here in the A box. Then 200 smokers, no cancer. So 100 non-smokers have cancer and then 100 non-smokers, no cancer. So that's how you would populate a two by two table. And we have a case control study. Remember we had two different types of observational studies that we will be talking about because that's what they mentioned in the CIC study guide. The first here is the case control study where you have two groups. You have a case and a control group, test groups with different exposures. So we're looking for different exposures here. Controls have the same characteristics of the cases with the exception of this exposure. So when you're dividing your population into cases and controls, 
you only want the one difference of exposure. Case control studies allow us to collect data retrospectively. They are cheaper, quicker, and require few subject, fewer subjects and cohort studies. And we calculate an odds ratio. And we do this by dividing A and D by B and C. And we interpret the odds ratio really similar to a SIR, which is why I put it in here. Uh, if you have an odds ratio less than one, the odds of exposure is the same in cases and controls. Or as a result of greater than one, the odds of exposure is more in cases than in controls. So here we are using our same example as we had before with the smokers and non-smokers. So we have disease status, exposure status, and so we have our 600 um, smokers up here that develop cancer, and we have our 200 um, smokers that don't have cancer, 100 smokers, non-smokers with cancer, and 100 non-smokers, no cancer. So if we want to figure out the odds ratio, it's A and D, which is 600 times 100 divided by 200 times 100. So for three, so three is greater than one, so the odds of exposure is more in cases than in controls, which is as we would expect. So in cohorts, the exposure is known and we follow to see who develops disease. Two types, uh, prospective and retrospective. So in an observational cohort study, subjects are enrolled or grouped on the basis of their exposure, then followed to document occurrence of disease. Prospective and retrospective cohorts. So the key difference between a cohort and a case control is that in a cohort, subjects are enrolled on the basis of their exposure, whereas in a case control, subjects are enrolled on the basis of whether they have the disease of interest or not. Both types of studies assess exposure and disease status. So in cohorts, we calculate relative risk. Risk is the probability that an adverse event will occur. At incidence, uh, how we calculate relative risk is incidence in exposed divided by incidence in unexposed. And it is influenced by sample size, as so much of statistics is. So if we just think about an example here of a large outbreak of hepatitis A that occurred in Pennsylvania in 2003, there were investigators that found almost all of the case patients had eaten at a particular restaurant during a two to six week in, uh, incubation period, which is the incubation period for hepatitis A, before the onset of the illness. And the investigators were able to narrow down their hypothesis to the restaurant, were able to exclude the food preparers and servers as the source. They needed to find the food that was contaminated. So they asked the case patients which restaurant foods they had eaten, but that only indicated which foods were populated. Investigators then looked at enrolling and interviewing a comparison of controlled group, a group of people who had eaten at the restaurant during the same time but didn't get sick. Of the 133 items on the restaurant menu, the most striking difference between case and control was the proportion that ate salsa. Further investigation of the ingredients in the salsa implemented green onions as a source of infection. Thereafter, the FDA issued an advisory to the public about green onions and the risk of Hep A. This action was in direct response to the convincing results of the analytical epidemiology, which compared the exposure history of case patients with that of an appropriate comparison group. So which type of an investigation is this? This is a case control investigation. Cohort and case control. Then we have the experimental studies. 
So this is when the researcher manipulates one or more variables while the others remain constant, can establish associations and may establish causality when other factors are strictly controlled. Uh, these are clinical trials. You always have to be careful in research of confounding variables. Variables not part of the original study, but can suggest a fault relationship between variables or can hide a relationship that actually exists. Confounding variables. So dare I say that is it. Again, please review this section, which has been very long, and then refer to your APIC certification study guide, sixth edition, for these questions in epidemiology. So as a reminder, you'll go to chapter three and look at question number 11. And that information will have been presented in the video here and hopefully you can answer that based on your learning of this information. Then you would go to chapter four of the APIC certification study guide six edition and look at all these questions, questions one, two, five, six, 10 through 38, 41, 42, 44, 45, 47, and 50 and be able to answer those questions and then chapter five and chapter eight and so on. For more information, please resort Please look at the resources listed here and please remember to subscribe to our channel and to like this YouTube video. Thank you so much for listening and good luck in your studies everyone.